It is week four in our um, study of what to do to know about God and the stuff that you need to know about God to really grow in a personal relationship with Him. Uh, the first week we just did a getting started. The second week we dealt with God. The third week, last week, we dealt with the Father and His personality. And this week we're going to learn about Jesus. Now, it is so easy to see Jesus in the New Testament. From the very first chapter on through the rest of the book of the Bible, the rest, Matthew through, it's about Jesus. It's about the church, his church, how to live in it, what happened, the development of all his plan. It is easy to see Jesus in the Bible. So for those who have a struggle with Jesus being the Son of God, I my purpose today is to show you how Jesus is actually all through the Old Testament also. Do you remember this chart? Here's this chart that I gave you and have given you several times already. In this chart, I have said God the Father is the one who designed the plan for creation. God the Son implemented the Father's plan for creation. God the Holy Spirit sustains and administers the Son's plan. So in this lesson, we are talking about Jesus, and he, he is found throughout God's Word from the very first story to the very last story. And in fact, God the Father designed everything like He's the architect. You heard me say that last week. God the Son is the one who was the builder, the con contractor, who took the plans from the Father and constructed it. And then God the Holy Spirit, this is not in the notes, but let me add it, is the one who was hovering over it all to make sure it held together and operated. Those are three job descriptions. Now, when I was 11 years old, I accepted the Lord as my Savior. But if you remember, I've told you many times, I have an 18-year perfect attendance pin set. 18 years. I was born on November the 3rd, and the next Sunday I was on a pillow in First Baptist Church of Marlowe, Oklahoma. And until after I was eight, my 18th year, I received a pin every year, and it's a whole chain of eight perfect attendants. It has a perfect attendance thing on top, and then 18 little things underneath it, which my churches, um, that used to be a big deal in churches, they gave it, to, gave it to me for me having a perfect attendance. When I became 11 years old, I already knew about God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But even, and even though I accepted the Lord as my Savior, I had some questions, and i got to be honest with you. I went to my pastor first. He couldn't explain it, not to my satisfaction. I went to my Bible teachers. They couldn't explain it, not to my satisfaction. I went to a junior college, Kilgore Junior College. That's not a religious school, but really and truly, the pastor I was working with there out at Laird Hill, he could not explain it. I asked other pastors in the Gregg County Association. They could not explain it to my satisfaction. They just believed it by faith. I remember my pastor as an 11-year-old, after accepting the Lord as my Savior, being baptized and me asking the question, he just patted me on the back and said, Son, that's something you're just going to have to accept by faith. And I'm going, okay, all these people have accepted it blindly by faith. I went to the seminary and asked the questions that I had. And I truly did not find the answers to answer my questions. So when I was attending, because I was in, a, in, a, in, in high school, I was in a gospel quartet. Two of us were Baptist, and two of us were two of us were charismatic. One was Assembly of God, and one was Pentecostal, and we were singing Southern Gospel music. Do you know where we sang the most? In Pentecostal and Assembly of God churches. In those churches, not all Assembly of God, but the one we happen to be in, 
they didn't believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit being three individual persons but one God. They believed they were all the exact same person. So when Jesus was in the garden praying to the Father, he was praying to himself. And so when Jesus was dead in the grave, the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. It was, G it was God himself, Jesus, raising himself from the dead. Okay, you accept that, but can you show me why you're saying that's a no? And the way they explained it is this, is this way. I, Jim Hastings, was the son of my parents, so I was a child. I am now married, so I have a wife, so I am a husband. And I now have a child, therefore I am a father. So I am a child, I am a husband, and I am a father, but they're all the same person. That's the way they explain that, and they call that oneness. And so when I'm going around to these Pentecostal and charismatic churches to sing, my home church is still a Baptist church where they believe God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one essence, one God who chose to present himself in three persons. They could not answer me. My seminary professors could not answer me. They would point out a scripture and say, see right there, see right there, that's the answer. And I'm going, yeah, where's the answer? Because when I'm reading this whole story, I'm not seeing what you're seeing. Well, I can answer you now, and you're getting today in this lesson what maybe three seminary graduates out of the 3,000 that will graduate every year, maybe three out of all the seminaries can tell you this. Every once in a while, I run across someone who is able to do what I am fixing to present to you today. In the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus, I promise you, is all the way through the Old Testament. So let's go back to the beginning. The bit you're saying, boy, you're sure staying in these lessons on Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. Yes. And as we progress, you'll even see up to chapter 11 of Genesis because it really lays the foundation for all the plans because we start seeing something presented to us so we can know God and we can get close to him and then it gives us more detail in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 uh, it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth so here in this opening of the first chapter of God's word you are introduced to God it's a name God and he's the creator and it gives a general overview of the six days of creation then you go down to chapter 2 where he's detailing more. It says 2 verse 4, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So here in the second chapter, more information is given about the sixth day of creation and specifically detailing, detailing the creation of man and woman who were created in the image of God. And here you see that it is a different name than chapter 1 but it includes the first name of the chapter 1 it is the what's the answer Lord God who made the earth and the heavens so it starts off as God and then he details it more by calling himself the Lord God well over in chapter 3 verse 8 it says Genesis 3 8 says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, here's a little note. This passage is written after Adam and Eve have eaten of that forbidden fruit, and they know that they have sinned. They know they have sinned. And so when they're dealing with this Lord God, it is the same, and here's another answer, Lord God who walked there in the garden with Adam and Eve before they had sinned and after they had sinned. It's the same Lord God. Well, as the Lord reveals 
the Father's, the architect's plan through God's word, you learn things about the, here's the word, Lord God, that are introduced in Genesis chapter 2, 4, and they go all the way through and grow and increase in the knowledge we have about this Lord God, all the way to Revelation chapter 22, verse 21, which is the last verse in the Bible. Here it is, Genesis 2, 4, remember that. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made earth and heaven. Revelation 22, 21. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Why doesn't it say the Lord God there? Why does it say that? Instead, it says the Lord Jesus. How many of you have gone by the exact same name all of your life? You've had the exact same name. You never had a nickname. Your daddy called you. Your mama called you. Roland. That's all. It's always been Roland. Well, you're a strange bird. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody? Nobody called you Pookie or anything like that or whatever. Your same name. Which name they go by? Well, they went by both. They went. My mother called me uh, Flossie. Oh, well, you had a nickname then. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 Roxanne, back there. You had a nickname. Oh, you forgot you did. Good. Okay. Well, I was called everything in the world. You know, in my house now, whenever something needs to get done, my wife says, well, somebody do this. That's my middle, new middle name, somebody. Okay. I know that means me, all right? I've been Jimmy. I've been James for a while. Some people called me Archie because my middle name is Arch. My grandfather's name was Archibald, and my parents were kind to me. They just shortened it to Arch. So I have been an Archie, I've been a Jimmy, I've been a James, I've been a Dr. Jim, I've been a somebody, and I've also been a nobody, different cases, <laughs> different times. Okay, that doesn't mean I'm a different person. It just means that he's adding to these names, and there's reasons why it says G Lord Jesus at the end and Lord God at the beginning, because as the Lord adds more information, we see the development of this change going towards Jesus who will be the Savior of the earth. Now, there's something i, I got to deal with right now, and I really, really, really don't want to deal with this, but I've got to. It's theological terms that I wish I could get away from. But the point of the theological terms, I want you to know them. The theological terms are here in the title. The pre-incarnate Lord and the incarnate Lord. Okay? Here are two descriptions of the Lord that are used by most preachers, by teachers, and by Bible students. And by, by, uh, by Bible students. They, listen, they just spout this out. And those of us who don't understand what the word incarnate means, it just kind of takes our attention off of what they're saying. And we just kind of sit there and glare eyed while we're trying to figure out what they're trying to say, as well as some of the other theological words that are used. So we need to understand, although the pre-incarnate and the incarnate, you don't find those words in the Bible anywhere. You do find the essence of their meaning there. In fact, for the pre-incarnate, refers to the Lord God, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, if you want to call it. And here's an answer for you, prior to him, to his birth. Prior to him being taken as a baby, coming as a baby. Everything he does in the Old Testament is called pre-incarnate Christ or the pre-incarnate Lord. After he is born, he is called the incarnate. He took on a body. He's, he's taken on flesh and blood. So one is before, pre-incarnate means before he took a body on and incarnate means after he took the body. Prior in the Old Testament, he was like God the Father and like God the Spirit. He was a spirit himself who moved and was able to show himself in the form of a person when he needed to and then disappear when he needed to, just as the Father and the Holy Spirit, they work like this. But once he took on a body of flesh, we call it the incarnate. Yes, sir, Savio. Yes, it does. Incarnate takes on the carnal 
you hear that. But see, these are difficult words for an eight-year-old or even a 58-year-old who's never known any of this. So these are just words we need to understand. It means pre in the Old Testament, and then the incarnate means in the uh, New Testament time, really, when he, after he had taken on the flesh. So do you see the word Lord that we're using? See that word Lord? I actually gave you a teaser on this last week because I, I wanted you to chew on the cud a little bit this week. You know what chew on the cud means? I mean, I've done a lot of that growing up and trying to get to know the Lord. I'd take something, put it in my mouth that, 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 um, that I'd learned, and I'd have to chew on a little bit and swallow, swallow it. And like an old cow, he'd come back up, and I'd chew on it a little more. And he'd go back down, and the next thing, a preacher would bring it back up, and I'd have to chew on it a little more. And everybody in this room has something that's in the Bible that you chew on and swallow it because you got to swallow it and then it comes back up like an old cow does and chew on you know what I'm talking about chewing on the cud you know I was thinking about it walking in today everybody had their Bibles some most everybody I have seen today I have seen if they're at least 24 years old I've seen them for 24 years because that's how long I've been around here and you would think after being here every Sunday morning and for a long time it was Sunday night and I see you on Wednesday nights it seems like we would have this down pat doesn't it it does seem to me like we would but we don't we don't maybe I have it down patter than some of y'all because I stay in it all the time when I'm not answering telephone calls and trying to help people with sin in their lives you know that's what my office does it's sin it really is uh, there are times I go into my office and I think I need to paint these walls uh, what these walls just heard no red no I can't scrape it off the walls what these walls just heard but I need to paint it at least cover it up a little bit you know I think about that well okay here we go there is a difference, and we, we must learn the difference and the important distinctions that very few people catch. Most people take, get a Bible, and you just start reading it. You just read it, and you don't have any idea how that Bible of yours has been laid out by a committee, and it's got little secrets in it that you need to know before you start reading. You say, secrets? What kind of secrets? Secrets from God? No little markings in this Bible that are there to help you understand why the committees who put these Bibles and have been very diligent to keep them as close to God's to close to the original as possible uh, and I say that with uh, very carefully they do that so that you can understand it you know for instance here in I just opened a Job and here I'm in the 30th chapter of Job and lo and behold as I go through this and just look there's all these words that are in italics what in the world is they doing in italics? Well, it just so happens the Hebrew language, which they took this from, and the English language are not laid out the same. You know the verbs and the nouns are changed around. So all these little um, words written in italics, I know because I've gone to the place to find out what it means, means that they had to add these words so that those of us who speak English can understand what they're trying to say. Now, most of us just go on. That means that that word is not in the original any place, but it is, it, is in, it is implied in the original. And for you to understand it in English, it's got to be put there. All right. So with that, you look at this. You say, okay, what's the difference between the word Lord and Lord and Lord? <laughs> and there's a big difference. Lord all capital. Lord with just a capital first L, and then Lord with no capital. What in the world does that mean? Well, the English translators and editors have used these three different forms of the word Lord on purpose. All you have to do, no matter what denomination you're part of in Christianity, when you use your Bible, you have to know why they used the word they used. Not knowing how to use your Bible literally has caused the division of Christianity into denominations. 
the Assembly of God had a group broke off of them back in uh, 1912 who called themselves Pentecostals. The Assembly of God believed in God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but the Pentecostal group that broke off did not. They believed it was all the same God, just talking to themselves. In 1914, in the General Council of the United States Assembly of God uh, convention, they proclaimed all Pentecostal churches to be a cult because they did not believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, Pentecostals, as we began with motor cars and things like that, began traveling around and they didn't have a Pentecostal church, so they just went back in to the nearest and newest thing, which was the Assembly of God churches. Today, if you go into Assembly of God church, you have to ask them, do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as three persons in one essence, or do you believe it is all one God and it's called oneness? You cannot walk into Assembly of God Church and just uh, expect it to be what we call a Trinitarian church. They're about half and half split, all members of the same convention. The group they condemned and called a cult reemerged into that church and brought their doctrine back with it, and it got accepted. Because the next generation, you need a fine young preacher, and he grew up in the Pentecostal background, and he's now the preacher of the Assembly of God Church. What's he going to teach? And what are the people going to believe? And all those people in the pews had to do was, as they were reading in their King James Version of the Bible, was go and look someplace to find out what those words meant. And so, with that, I tell you this. You should read the preface of every Bible that you plan to use in your study of God's Word. It's in the preface. That's where it is. Every preface explains all the special markings that the editors use for special words and text. They tell you, well, in my preface of this Bible, there it is in that part of the preface. It's under the, it's under the section um, called um, uh, uh, Special Things on Translation. There's a section that talks about the proper name of God in the Old Testament. And I've highlighted for you the part down at the bottom, talking about the four letters called YHWH, as seen in Exodus 2.14. That's the word Yahweh. That name has not been pronounced by the Jews because of the reverence for the great sacredness of the divine name. Therefore, it has been consistently translated LORD, all capital letters, through the New American Standard except for in the case where it comes very, very close to the word Adonai, of which the Jews, as they stop using the name Yahweh in history because it's too sacred to use, they use the word Adonai, which also means Lord, and they spell that with just a capital L-O-R-D instead of all caps of some form. And they, and, and they, whenever the word Yahweh is used close, the word Lord there is usually capitalized also, and the Lord Adonai is not capitalized, so that you know they're talking about the same person, but but they don't use the word Yahweh anymore. In fact, as time came along, in order for them not to pronounce the word Yahweh, they added vowels to it so that they could pronounce it Jehovah. You got it? Because they could pronounce Jehovah, they just could not pronounce Yahweh. And that was a thing that they didn't do. And listen... That goes across cultural lines in different religions too where they don't dare show a picture of their prophet or what. That's all in that thinking that was in that time frame. So you need to read in your preface. Well, if you opened up the preface of our Bible and our, uh, be it the New American Standard or maybe the NIV. I did not put the King James. I probably should have put how it is in there. But here in the New American Standard, it's all caps. For the NIV, the word Yahweh is translated in the NIV with a capital L and then small caps for the rest of the word Lord. Uh, it, it's the Hebrew word Yahweh, and that word has a meaning. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is there at the burning bush, and he's been given the instruction at 80 years old to go back to Egypt and lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And Moses asks the voice in the burning bush, who am I to tell Pharaoh has, who's to give me 
has given me this authority to command the Israelites to be let go. And the answer out of the burning bush, tell him, I am that I am has sent you. The word I am that I am is in English is one word in Hebrew, Yahweh. You got it? It's very important. Because when Moses goes and says, and Pharaoh says, who gave you this authority? Moses says, Yahweh. And that means he says, I am that I am has told you. Well, when the word Lord, without all being all caps, but the first letter is capitalized, that is a translation in the Hebrew and in the Old Testament, New Testament. In the Hebrew, it's the word Adonai. And in the, in the New Testament, the Greek, it is Kyrios. They both mean the same thing. It's, a, it's the Lord in his position. Whenever you see it, when it's just small letters, that goes to different words for Lord. That's like your regular master, your, your employer and all that. That's for the word mar, mare in Hebrew or the word serene in Greek. Those are like government officials. So when you see the Lord capitalized of lords, the little lords are one of these other words. And the, big, the capitalized Lord is the Lord that means Adonai or Yahweh. And it can mean either because it's written both ways through the scripture. Depending on what time in the history line this, it was written. So for this lesson, we're going to concentrate on the word Lord all capitalized. Because it's found in our English translations and versions. And so I ask you. I ask you this question, does the scripture use Lord to identify Jesus? Well, the answer is yes, and we're going to see that. Here are four examples. Here are four examples. In the Old Testament, we're just talking about finding Jesus in the Old Testament. That's what we're doing. We're not talking about his job duties, although we'll find some of that here. We're talking about Jesus in the Old Testament. Because he's easy. You read your homework. It's easy to find Jesus in the New Testament. But as a new person, it would be difficult to find Jesus in the Old Testament until you start matching some things up. If you start at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, and you read to Revelation 22-21 without stopping, reading it like a book, without stopping, as fast as you can, You'll see this progression, and you'll see it adding on like a good novel, adding things into it so that you start grabbing all the plots and everything and how they all are working together for one purpose for God so that you can understand Him. In the Old Testament, over in Isaiah, and I know it's a prophecy book, Isaiah is foretelling that there's a person going to come that is going to precede and announce the arrival of the Lord slash Yahweh. There's a person who's going to come who's going to announce Yahweh's arrival. So here's, here's the passage over in Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3. A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord. It's the word Yahweh. In the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for God's people. Well, when you go over to Mark in the New Testament, Mark is speaking about John the Baptist here. He's telling us who this person is that's coming to identify the one who's going to precede, uh, come after John the Baptist. And he's announcing this special person's arrival, Yahweh's arrival. And it's going to be the Lord Jesus who is Yahweh when he says in the scripture, he says... Mark, in Mark chapter 1, verses, verses 2 and 3, he says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, real difficult to find, right? It tells us. I'm telling you, folks, this Bible tells you where to go to find your answers. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the path, his path, his path straight. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. It's right out of Isaiah, and in Mark, he's talking about the Lord Jesus. In Isaiah, he's talking about the Lord Yahweh. Hmm, interesting. It's got to be the same person. Either that, or there's some problem. It's wrong. Oh, wait a minute. 
remember, I'm just, remember, I'm just showing you four examples. I could show you multiple examples now, but I'm just going to show you four. Look over down here in Joel. Joel is, Joel is the very first prophet to write down a prophet book. He is the oldest of all the prophet books. Joel, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Amos, Micah, Zechariah. Joel is the first to write it down. Now we've got other prophets that are over in Kings and in, in those stories and in 1 Samuel. And even before that, we've got other prophets. But the first prophet book that was delivered by the Lord to just be a prophet book sitting aside by itself to tell us information is Joel. And Joel, way early, way early, is explaining how to obtain salvation. And you obtain it through the Lord Yahweh. Here it is. Look here. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. How are you delivered from this world? You're delivered by calling upon the name of the Lord. Well, Peter can't let that go over in the New Testament. Peter is explaining to the people there in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost how to be saved, how to have salvation. And it is through the Lord Jesus, Yahweh's, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Where did he get that? Out of Joel. As it is written. Remember, he starts the, the message after he does his intro. And he's talking about what Joel has said. And he comes to this point. You want to have salvation? You want to be delivered? The way you do it is by calling upon the name of the Lord. Paul. Paul is explaining to how to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus also when he says, For there is no distinction between Jews and Greeks, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Hmm. Talking about Jesus must be the same. Let's go to a different one here. Over in the Old Testament, the Lord is explaining how many will be blinded when he arrives. The Lord Jehovah is telling us through Isaiah again, when I come, a whole bunch of folks are going to be blinded and they're not going to accept me when I come to be their Messiah, to be their Jehovah. So here in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, it says this. It says, then I said, I couldn't leave this part out because it's so good. All right, I couldn't leave it out. It says, then I said, woe is me for I am ruined. That's Isaiah talking. Because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim, now a seraphim is, a, is the name of an angel and that seraphim means a group of, is the name for multiple angels. And so he, here he says, just one of them came uh, and flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He reached over in the altar, got a piece of burning coal, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, Isaiah, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven, saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Us. Us. Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people. You keep on listening, but you don't perceive. You keep on looking, but you do not understand. You render the hearts of these people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return to be healed. Oh, they're listening, but they're not hearing. They're seeing, but they're not going to be believing. And if they just take it in and take it into their hearts, they would get it and they would be changed. Well, when the Lord comes over, over in John chapter 12, verse 36 through 43, the Lord is explaining how many were blinded when he got there. 
In the Isaiah passage, he talks about how many are going to be blinded. And when he gets here, he's talking about those, how many that are blinded. And look at what he uses. He says, while you have the light, believe in the light in order that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke and he departed and he hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this cause they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their hearts, or their heart, lest they see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted. And I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory. The glory of who? Yahweh over here. Remember, he says, I've seen Yahweh, okay? And he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not, were not confessing him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved and approved of the love and approval of men rather than the approval of God. It's the same story. In the New Testament, it's talking about Jesus. In the Old Testament, it's talking about the Yahweh to come. Okay, that's three examples. Let's get our fourth one. Here we go. In Isaiah, again, Isaiah chapter 44, verses 4 through 7, Isaiah is told that the Lord Yahweh is the first and the last. Here it is in the scripture. Thus says the Lord, capital letter Lord Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh. Thus says, I am that I am, in other words. The King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord, the Yahweh of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. And there is no God besides me. And who is like me? And then he goes on to say, if there's any out, out there that's like me, show them to me. He goes on to say, you let them tell you about how everything was created in the ancient world and you let them tell you what's going to happen in the future. And when you find that person, you'll know it's Yahweh. Holy moly. Okay. Look over in Revelation chapter 1, 17 through 18. Jesus identifies himself as the Lord Jesus Yahweh, the first and the last when he says this. Now, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. This is John speaking. And he laid his hand upon me, saying, and Jesus laid his hand upon John, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Huh. They must be the same. In my mind, they're the same. Have I proved my point? I, I can show you many more, but just for this, I think I've proved my point. Every time you see the capital letters Lord in the Old Testament, our writers, our translators have been faithful to tell us that's the word Yahweh, and that's the same Yahweh of the Old Testament, it's the same Yahweh of the New Testament, because where it's capitalized in the New Testament, it's talking about the same thing. So, having established that Jesus is one person of God in the Word, you can now discover some of His job duties and how He's different from the Father and the duties different from the Holy Spirit that Jesus performs. Now, remember we dealt with that word pre-incarnate and incarnate. Taking on the flesh and not having the flesh. Well, for this study... We're going to compare, still compare, the Old Testament pre-incarnate with the New Testament incarnation of the Lord. We're going to stay there, but we're going to look at some of his duties. So here, and on the screen that you see, it's a little bit smaller. That's so that it all can go up, and I'm, I had to put it that way, so to tell you which page we're on. In the pre-incarnate, I'm dealing with the Psalms. Now, these Psalms are written by David as praises and worship and music to be delivered to the Lord every time they sing these things. And in Psalms 45, 4, it says this, And in your majesty ride on victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach 
you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp. The peoples fall under you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprighteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. When we go over to Hebrews chapter 1, starting with verse 8, the Hebrew writer says, But of the Son, that's Jesus, He says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and thy righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, thy God, hate and anointed, I mean, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy companions. Hmm. Companions, that's fellows. Joy, that's gladness. It's the same passage. And in fact, in the New American Standard, it's in all capital letters because that means if you read your preface, that came from someplace else in the Bible. It's not the first time it was delivered. It's being delivered the second or third time. The first time it's delivered, it's always like in Psalms 45. But if it's ever quoted again later at a different time, our translators help us know that that's from someplace else. That is from the Old Testament Hebrews chapter, I mean Psalms chapter 45. Well, reading on in Psalms 102 verse 24, it says, I say, O oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations of old. You founded the earth and the heavens are the works or the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure, and all of them will wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be changed. Ah, back over in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. Taken out of the Psalms passage, talking about Jesus. Therefore, we can ask these questions. From these, we can see that Jesus blank over everything. What's that word? He does. He rules over everything. And we also see that Jesus blank everything. What is it? Created everything. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. Going on. Here, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it says, All of us are like sheep that have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord... Yahweh, has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearer. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression, a judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Mercy. When Isaiah is delivering this to King Hezekiah to give him hope and to tell this message, for Hezekiah to tell this message to his people, they couldn't have understood what it was talking about. Oh, but when we get into the New Testament, after the Gospels, the lead apostle, his name was Peter. Peter could write it down because he had set at Jesus' feet and he could explain it all. And there it is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Hmm, that's from down at the bottom of that Isaiah 53 passage. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return, while suffering, but kept his 
uh, uh, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously and to himself himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds we were healed for you were continually straying like sheep but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls taking from the first part for we all like sheep have gone astray peter tells us who it is it's jesus therefore jesus came as lord to suffer and die on as a sacrifice to bear our sins the sins for all men same passage same person old testament and new let's do it again in psalms chapter 40 verse 6 another job description of jesus sacrifice and meal offerings you have not desired my ears you have opened Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will. O oh my God, your law is within my heart. Well, over in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it says this. For it is possible for if for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. See, he didn't desire those over there, and he didn't require them to take away sins. They were an offering, a gift. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I do your will O oh God, after saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins you have not desired, nor having you taken pleasure in them. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. And by this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Sanctified needs to be, I need to put this note in here. Sanctified means to be set apart and to be different and to be cleansed and to be put into a different category. So Jesus came as the Lord to provide a sacrifice which will sanctify you once and for all. Not over and over and over is it needed like those sacrifices were. This is a once and for all thing. All right, here. In um, Samuel, Second Samuel, chapter seven, verse sixteen, he says, "And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever." In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Nathan the prophet is telling David that his throne is going to be established. And we, as we read on, we find out that there's someone going to come and sit on the throne of David to fulfill and be the king of kings and the lords of lords and be the one who brings salvation forever. Okay, that's in 1 2 Samuel 7, 16. Psalms 132, 11 says, The Lord has sworn to David. It's another passage telling us the same thing. A truth from which he will not turn back. Of the fruit of your body I will set upon your throne. The Lord is saying the Yahweh is promising here from the fruit of the body of David, he's going to take on the flesh and he's going to set as Yahweh on the throne of David. In Psalms chapter 16, verse 8, I have set the Yahweh continually before me. Now listen, because he is at my right hand. That's the Lord. The Father is speaking here about the Lord at his right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. That's from three different Old Testament passages telling us about the promise of the throne of David, a Davidic covenant from God 
that he's going to keep, and about the Father, talking about the Lord. Well, over in Peter's message in Acts chapter 20, I mean Acts chapter 2, verse 29, he says, Brethren, this is on the day of Pentecost, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. In that day they knew where David was buried. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did he, uh, his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God, you see, the word, see how he used it there? Raised up again to which we are all witnesses. All right, now listen here. In that, you see the word shio in the Hebrew, that's over in the Psalms passage, and Hades in Greek. They're both the same places. Uh, shio or Hades, one is Old Testament Hebrew, the other is New Testament Greek. They represent the same place of peaceful, sweet rest while they are waiting for the Lord to take them from that place and to take them to be in heaven. Well, one more of these. Just one more. Look here. In Psalms chapter 68, verse, six, verse 18, talking about the pre-incarnate Lord Yahweh, the Lord Jesus. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captive thy captives. Thou hast received gifts among men. Even among the rebellious also the Lord, that's Yahweh, I am that I am, God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord, that's Adonai, who daily bears our burdens. The God who is our salvation, Selah. The word Selah is a musical term that means stop what you're doing and listen and think about what just was said. So here we've got that. Now over in Ephesians, Paul picks up with this same, same thought. He says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. So Christ is giving gifts of grace according to a measure. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, huh, that came out of this, Psalm 68 passage. He led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Wonder what those gifts are. I'm going to help you here. Watch. And he gave some as. There's one of the gifts. He gave some as prophets. He gave some as evangelists. Some as pastors. Some as teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to get all this learned so that we can grow in maturity and then be with Christ to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ I've got them circled up there those are the gifts oops I didn't got them all circled do I couple of more. Let's get them a couple more circled. There we go. They're circled. You can circle them. Those are gifts. Those are not gifts of the Holy Spirit. Those are gifts of Christ. They are the offices of the church. Now, folks, there are no apostles any longer because Jesus is the one who picked the apostles, the twelve. After they died, the rest of them are still in, vote, in place. Now, that word prophet doesn't mean somebody can tell the future. That's the word prophet that, can, that says, I'm telling you what's been told. All right, actually, we've got a question. Jesus gives what to those who belong to who? That's right. Jesus gives gifts to those who belong to him. All right, everybody, everybody's eyes, look up here. What do you see? I have the pleasure of being one of those gifts because I'm your teacher. You see it? All right. You saw one out in the auditorium a while ago. A gift to you. And we should be careful as the gifts to make sure we uphold the righteousness of Christ and be what Christ wants us to be for you. And if you see one of us doing wrong, tell us. Tell us quickly. If they spit in your face, go someplace else. 
because they are not worthy being your gift. Just my opinion. <laughs> Actually, there are many more differences between God and the Father and God the Son that are presented in God's Word. Let's just go through a few of them real quickly because our time is running out. First, God was both, Jesus was both God and man. When he came to the world, he took on 100%, he was still 100% God, but he was 100% man. He was Emmanuel, and that means God with us or God with humanity, and he is with you. Number two, he made you perfect by what he did on the cross. When you accepted him to be your Savior, he made you perfect. You are ready to go. But we'll explain that when we get to the salvation passage. He died in your place for your sin. What you, what you deserved, he did for you. Uh, he will keep you for, uh, he will preserve you for his heavenly kingdom. No one can take you out of his hands. He will keep you forever by his power. He will keep you from falling and present you spotless to the Father. Now, as you take your Bible and you read it as you're learning to grow and get close to him and read God's word, you will find that God does not tell you that it's his plan to operate in creation in the form of three persons. He just simply tells you what those three persons do. He just lays it out as a fact. Remember Genesis chapter 1? We all have read it for years and we thought about it. It was about creation. But when we looked at that one word that kept showing up through the chapter 32 times, the word was, it was about God. It really was about God. One final, here it is. You need to understand, God shows us himself in three persons and it's like this chart god is god the father god is god the son the lord and god is the holy spirit one final passage is very important to us luke chapter 22 verse 70 jesus has been taken from the garden of gethsemane he is in with the pharisees and the scribes and um, they are asking him there the scribes and the pharisees are, and the priests are asking him Are you the Son of God? Now remember, the word Yahweh means I am that I am. And so when they ask him this question, Jesus' answer makes them furious because he says, Yes, I am. His answer in Hebrew is, Yes, Yahweh. They've been looking for the Messiah. They've been looking for Yahweh. When Adam and Eve were in the garden and they had sinned, and lo and behold, Eve gives birth to Cain. Eve says, oh my, the Lord has given me the Lord because she was looking for the Yahweh to come take away the sin that they had committed. And from that time on, the Jews were looking for Yahweh. They were expecting him. Even though they killed all these prophets, they killed all these godly men, the Jews still hung on to those books in the next generation so that we've got them. They were looking for him, but they rejected him. So he answered, his answer made them mad, mad because he was really saying to them, he was saying, yes, Yahweh, yes, I am the Lord God. He's all the way through the Bible, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for studying, allowing us to study your word in your name. Amen. Yes, sir.